Welcome to the Business Titans podcast, where we talk everything to do with growing and scaling your business. I'm your host, Oscar Chavez, and today we have a very, very exclusive guest for you. His name is Spencer Shaw. He is the host of the Business Growth Podcast. This guy's been doing podcasting since before podcasting was cool. He's also the founder of a software development company. And before the internet, he was a bass player and a singer in a boy band. He's lived in a couple of countries, he's a digital nomad, he speaks Spanish, happily married with three wonderful kids. How are you today, Spencer? I'm doing awesome, it's so good to be with you. Yeah, so good to be with you too, brother. So I'm gonna ask you a question. You are a serial entrepreneur and very successful at that. What, what, what was that moment in your life where you, where you really thought to yourself, you know what, the normal path isn't for me, traditional worn out path, I'm not doing it that way. I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. What, what was that moment in your life like? And what was it like in, during that time? Um, it, it happened when I was younger. Uh, I, I probably, I can think of a few moments, but I remember, I haven't thought of this memory for like a long time, but I remember it was senior, senior year in high school. And I think the statute of limitations is like seven years, right? Where they can't come back and claw something. Good. Okay. So here we go. Um, I was a senior year in high school and we had to do this big senior paper and it was required tons of work and all kinds of, uh, you know, assembly of documentation, which I had done. And then we had to write a massive report and I had to put like 20 plus hours into a project. Well, my best friend was great at writing papers. I hated it. And he had a landscape project at his house that his dad was making him do. I liked landscaping. So I said, I will do the landscaping if you write my paper. <laughs> and I did all the other work. And his dad looked at me and he goes, you're smart. You're going to make it. <laughs> and that's just kind of the way that I've lived and done business that I, I find ways to collaborate and I find ways to do things on my terms. And it's just worked out ever since then. I love it. And I love I love how joyful you get when you when you speak about those moments in your life where you're like, you know, this is this is this is just how I've always been. Now, is is entrepreneurship tied to personality type or can you, you know, regardless of what personality type, can you be a successful entrepreneur? I think you can be successful regardless. Uh, I've met people that are stone cold awful communicators that are incredibly successful and I've met super charismatic people that are successful. Uh, I, I think it's a matter of, uh, you know, the right elements uh, of focus, determination, and doing the right things at the right time with the right people. And then it works out. Okay. So fo focus, determination, doing the right things at the right times with the right people. So if, if, if someone's in a position where they're like, you know what, I've been doing my business for, for quite some time now, and, and it's just not working. And I'm, 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 I'm spinning my wheels here. I'm really trying to scale to the next level. What, what advice would you give to people that are in that predicament where they, they're qu not quite sure where to go next? Um, I, I think it depends on the business itself, but in some cases uh, you should probably quit. You should probably stop that business and start something else uh, if you're not getting traction. Uh, in certain situations, it could be that uh, there are just a few elements that are off. Maybe uh, you have a lot of customers that like you and you're overworked, but you're not making enough money. So that's probably a pricing element or you know, you're not able to form the right, right relationship or convey the proper value. Um, it could be other times when you're too early in the marketplace and you're spinning your wheels. And there's times when you're too late in the marketplace. Um, there's also, you know, the case, you know, we've read the E-Myth and most of us have heard about that book. And you've got the technicians out there that are really good at what they do. But because they're good at what they do, they're not doing the things to grow the business. So they should bring in consultants or bring in salespeople or bring in ops to take care of the things that supplement where they're not good. So it, it really is a math equation that you have to get some more variables to figure out the, the problem to it. And how do you, how do you, how do you pinpoint it? How do you, how do you start to discover those variables that, that, that are there? Because I find that a lot of times uh, because business owners are, are so in the work, they sometimes lack that insight to, to go within and really start to pinpoint these areas. So what, what do you think people should be doing to really start identifying these areas to 
formulates the uh, the components of the math equation that they need to execute. I think uh, some of it comes down to idea, or should I say love of the idea. If you meet a, a you know an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur, whatever you want to call them, uh, that that loves the idea too much, that might be a red flag. Um, because you should have traction regardless of whatever it is, whatever you're doing, you should have traction early on. And if you're hitting deaf ears or you're not getting traction, that's an immediate sign that that's something that you shouldn't do, or you need to adjust it and get validation on that. Uh, in other cases, there are people that are, you know, really charismatic and, you know, I see this happen a lot where people are so charismatic and they're excited and they start that idea and then they fizzle out and go to the next idea and they get excited and then they fizzle out and go to the next. And a lot of those people will probably never make it unless they get the right people on board with them. And so that tends to be a person that's, you know, uh, a good presenter, maybe a good salesperson, a good hype person or whatever it is. And then they just need other people to supplement and fulfill and implement the other things. So it, it depends. Yeah. Okay. Look, my, my connection dropped a little bit. I lost about 10 seconds. If you could uh, repeat some of that for me, Spencer, that'd be much appreciated. Sure. Um, do you want me to go back and, and get both sides of it? Would that be helpful? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Okay. Go for cool. it. Um, so I think it, it really depends uh, on this because, you know, if uh, you find people that are in love with the idea, mm -hmm. when they love the idea, that can be really dangerous because you're just loving what that is and you're not getting validation. And your idea means nothing. Uh, the ex what the customer is getting, what's happening there is what it is where the focus should be. And then you see the same happen with people that do a business and they are, uh, a hype person, or maybe they get really excited and they start a business and then they go to the next and then they go to the next and they go to the next and never get traction. And it doesn't mean that they won't have success. It just means that they're missing an element. So unless they pull in someone that's an implementer and that's able to do the things that cause the success, meaning, you know, the person that's able to close the deals or uh, fulfill on whatever it is that's being done, uh, if they don't get that, then they'll probably never have success. And that's just frustrating. Yeah, wonderful. I, I love that. And and your advice is very, um, very pragmatic, I would say. It's very, it, 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 it is great feedback to really help people uh, unpack the situation, find out where they're, uh, where they're weak and where they need to implement. Now, you're the guy that introduced me to, to Dan Pena. I had no idea who Dan Pena was <laughs> before before I came across, um, before I came across yourself in the business growth podcast. Now, for those of you who don't know Dan Pena, you should really have a look. Is they call him the fifty billion dollar man? Although I think that number's increased significantly since uh, since I came across Dan Pena. But what was it like to meet Dan Pena? Did it, did it change your life? What what was that like, Spencer? Yeah, it was actually it was life changing. Um, Dan Pena is, um, he's bold, he's confident. <laughs> Uh, he's direct. Um, he he doesn't sugarcoat it at all, and it can be really hard to swallow. But what Dan Pena says is absolutely how it works and how it is at playing business at the highest levels. Now, uh, I will have to throw an asterisk next to that. Uh, Dan Pena's model is not for everyone. It works for some people and it, and it doesn't work for some people. Um, here's something about Dan Pena is that he's, he's a man of integrity. And a lot of people don't realize that they think he, um, he's just so brash or the way he speaks, but no, he's, he's a man of integrity. He's a good guy. And um, after meeting with Dan and spending time and going through things, uh, it kind of rocked my world, actually. It really rocked my world. And what I mean is, you know, I, I, I looked at everything that I was doing because I had, you know, built and sold businesses at that point. And then I had created lifestyle businesses. And Dan put me in this position where I wanted to go down this route. Um, and so, you know, formed a partnership and looked at purchasing uh, some large medical companies. And doing the due diligence and going down that path, I realized that's not exactly what I want. 
I, I love what I've created now. And I pull the elements that Pena has taught and use it to me, but all the other elements, it's, it's just not my style. Mm. So what, what is your, what is your style Spencer? Um, for me, uh, freedom is the most important thing. Mm. And, uh, freedom means something different to everyone, but freedom, uh, is to me is being able to be in a place where I get to invent, where I get to employ people, where I get to, um, uh, create, uh, collaborations that are larger than I could ever imagine. Um, but it's not a business that owns me. Mm. So I'm not interested in something that is going to consume my life. Um, you know, I've, I've had, I mean, just recently I had an opportunity to sell one of my companies and it would have been a really good payday, but I'd have to give up a large chunk of my life, um, through the tenure, you know, of working, uh, after the sale of that company within the new company and not willing to do it. Um, and it, you know, 20 years ago, I probably would have, uh, now I'm older and it's just something that I don't want to do, but, um, you know, I think anything that we do, you have to know the reason why. I mean, there are people that um, love to work, you know, 20 hours a day and that's their gig. And there are other people that really don't want to do that. Um, but I do think that you should be actively involved and play at the highest level of whatever you're going to do. Hmm. I love that. So get, get involved, play at the highest level. How do, what, what's, the, what's the methodology to play at the highest level? Is it understanding... Uh, your own personality, how much you want to put into that, and then adding uh, immense focus to that time? Or is there is there other elements to this as well, Spencer? Um, I think it's adding the right people. So uh, there's a guy named Dan Sullivan. Uh, he wrote a book called Who Not How. It's a principle that he has. And so for me, uh, whenever I do any new project, I'm always thinking of who is going to drive the project and who's going to run it. Um, before I will put any capital or time into it. Uh, it's not something that I want to do. Now, you know, once I uh, know that someone else can do it and what roles they would take, then I'll move forward. But, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm not interested in the world of grinding it out. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's just not that phase of life right now. But there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want. If you're a single person, you know, single guy, single girl, and you're looking to make that impression, do it. But I think it's easy, and you and I have had conversations, it's really easy to forget the reason why we are doing things. So, mm. you know, we typically start business because we want a better life for our family. And it's easy to get off track and make a ton of money and justify, oh, I've done this for my family, but... In reality, it's maybe because of status or importance or because of the, the accolades or the cool cars or whatever that is. And at the end of the day, none of that stuff matters because, you know, if you have kids, that time is limited. That at most, you get 18 years at most. And then that time is gone. And the last thing that you're going to want, because my kids are getting older, like the last thing I'm going to want is for my kids to say, gosh, I wish you were there. <laughs> Now, this is one of the reasons I love you, Spencer, because you really are family oriented and I love entrepreneurs that can, that can have it all, right? There's, there's a saying that you can have it all, but not all at the same time. And, I, and I, I'm the same as you in that I really want to sow into my kids and, and be there for them. I never want them to, to say, you know, you weren't there for me. So what, what, what can, you know, those, those, I find that, I'll get your, your, your take on this. I find that spending time with the kids requires me to do a lot of inner work because kids are not, it's not like kids are the type that are like, you know what? It's just all about, I'm going to be just on my best behavior all the time so that you're like all happy. <laughs> like they're not, they're not uh, external focused. They're more uh, internal focused. Right. And so it's easy for our egos to drive us to, you know, uh, you know, this is hard. I'm just going to go to work because work's predictable. No one's going to come and be, you know, crazy and I can just, you know, get my work done. That's why some people throw themselves into work because they don't know how to spend time with their family in a way that makes, that makes it meaningful or fulfilling. It's more work or more frustrating. Right. And for me, it's been a real big challenge to try to, to balance that out and spend 
quality time with them. What, what's your advice for, for, for people that are running businesses, so entrepreneurs, but they have kids, but they're still trapped in the hustle. What, what, what would you say to those people? Um, I'd say uh, study hostage negotiation and then you know how to deal with kids. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> no. I mean, uh, you know, what you said is, is, is valid that uh, it's easy to decide to go and work more because by working more, it's predictable. And by working more and having success, then we feel like we did something. And with kids, it's difficult because you can't often see the results of your labors at the present time. You know, it's something that uh, happens in the future and it typically happens in really subtle ways. And so by investing in them at the moment and the times when it's good and the times that it's bad, it's fast forward and you'll get glimpses and say, oh, wait, that little human did something right. Or they, they, they were able to think abundantly or wow, they, they were innovative here. Um, that's, that's the payoff and that's mm. where it becomes worth it. And so are you, are you teaching your kids these concepts of, of, of innovation and, and personal development and, and are you getting to that level with the kids and, and teaching them these life skills that they need? Oh yeah. I'll give you a perfect example. We were in Mexico city uh, a couple months ago and uh, you know, you have a, in, in Mexico city uh, you have doormen in large buildings. And so we were in an Airbnb, we brought our, garbage down because there wasn't a, like a garbage bin uh, inside the building. And so we bring it down to the uh, bottom level and the doorman's outside sitting in a chair. And I go, hey, where do we put the garbage? Luckily, I speak Spanish. So I was able to talk with him in Spanish. And he's like, oh, um, today's garbage. Uh, today's garbage day. So you just have to hang around here and they'll ring a bell. And then you come out with your garbage and bring it to the truck. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, well, is there a place to put it? And he's like, no, you just have to, to wait for it. And I sit there, I'm like, well, this is asinine. No way I'm going to do this. So I put the garbage down. I reach in my wallet. I grab some pesos and I look at him. I go, Hey, would you mind if I paid you to hold on to our garbage and you can just take it to the truck for us? And he's like, that'd be great. And I looked at the kids and I, and I, and it wasn't a ton of money. And I said, look, guys, as we walked away, I didn't say this in front of him, but I was like, look, like, hey, you know, we had a problem. We could have wasted our day and waited for the garbage truck, but I found a solution to the problem. He got paid. We got our time. Everyone won. That's innovation right there. And that's a lesson that like they learned. And I love that. Yeah, but they're, they're the, the really powerful lessons uh, that we can teach our kids because at the end of the day, entrepreneurship is is a mindset. It is it is the way we the way we view the world. Are there any times you can share, Spencer, where you've you've had to do a real labor of love with the kids and 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 I mean I remember one time where I, I had to cry with my daughter for about forty five minutes to to kind of get through whatever she was going through. Uh, are there moments where it really does become an emotional battle that you've got to deal with to to help your kids get to the next level? Uh, yeah, I think it happens a lot. Um... You know, the, the more mature you get, the more you realize that the less force that you use and the more persuasion or even even extracting persuasion and just, you know, being real and honest is the best. Uh, I remember we were um, another experience just recently in Mexico and they have these things called cenotes, which are like open water pits. And my daughter, she totally doesn't like jumping from heights. She's only nine. And, you know, we're like, hey, do you want to jump from this? And she's like, no. And we're all swimming in the water. And, you know, 30 minutes later, you see her go up the stairs, gets to the edge. She goes three, two, one, and she jumps off. And we like, it was at that moment, it was like the Disney special family where we're like, yeah, all in the water and we're like yeah and like we gave everyone a high five it was like one of those magical moments it was cool um but had i coerced her no way she would have jumped off and the sad thing is you know earlier that week we were at a different cenote 
And I overheard a family and the mom was like, Hey, if you jump off, um, and she was like bribing the kids, like things that she was going to do for them. And like, I, I won't do that. I won't bribe the kids to do anything because they have to earn it and they have to want it. And if they learn at that young age that they're doing something for external purposes, I have seriously made a, a disservice for them because now I've robbed them from the opportunity of achieving things internally. Mm. And that's where it's harder. And that's where the wisdom and discipline comes in. Um, and it, you know, it takes time as parenting to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. I love that. And it, it is, it is a labor of love that you've really got to think of it from the kid's perspective and how they, what lessons and how this will help them mature and develop as, as individuals. Um, mm -hmm. Because otherwise we're not there for them as much as we, as much as we could be, or we're being more selfish about the way we raise our kids. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've seen kids, seen parents just yell at their kids in order to get them to do something. That's not how to treat other human beings. Would you agree with that? I totally agree. There's, n there's no reason for that. I cannot say that I've been perfect and that I haven't done that. I, I have so many mistakes and so many things I've screwed up on. Um, but I think I'm getting better. <laughs> yeah. So that's good. <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's a progress for sure. So you're the, you're the, I'm going to call you the, the king of podcasting. What, what, what can people do? I mean, first of all, like why should business owners podcast? And if so, why? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, there's, there's probably certain circumstances where a person shouldn't, and it depends on, you know, the, the specific circumstance, but I think that it is the most powerful communication tool out there because it is, uh, long form conversation. Uh, it is a vehicle to be able to create content and it is a way to be able to intimately um, connect with an audience. It's a one to many and it's different than video. See, video is great and, you know, we can see people and uh, different emotions, but it's not as in intimate because, you know, when you're watching a video, you may be distracted. Um, but there's still a spatial distance. When you're doing a podcast, you've got it in your ears and you may be doing things that uh, are more anchor type of moments. So you, any of listeners right now and yourself included, you'll probably remember like great ideas or something that's happened. And when you flash to that great idea, you actually remember the location that you were as well. And you're not gonna get that with video. Um, that's, that's the reason why the podcasting is so critical. And so our company has really made the effort to uh, be world-class in the podcasting arena. And, you know, we've been at it for eight plus years before podcasting was super popular. Yeah. Well, so what are the, some of the, the, the tips, techniques that people can use to get great people on their podcasts? Cause you, you're one of the people that has some of the greatest minds uh, in the world on your podcast. What, what, what are some of the tips that people can use to uh, do the reach outs and, and secure people for meetings? Um, so first is make sure you have the right people on. Uh, there's different tiers and different quality levels. Uh, there are some people out there that go on podcasts and like they say the same thing every time, just on 50 different, 50 different shows. Um, there are podcast hosts out there meaning the person that's driving it, that it asks the same questions. So, um, I would avoid those types of conversations at all costs. So if it's a podcast and it's like always the same questions, I would just bail on that. Um, if it's a, you know, a person that just is robotic and answers the same and it's so polished, I'd skip on that. Um, you, you want those interesting people. Uh, yes, there are certain games you can play. You meaning, and I'm not saying this in a derogatory sense, uh, you just have to be really strategic. So meaning there are certain guests that you can get on that will boost your numbers or boost your credibility. And there's nothing wrong with having those people as long as uh, you understand why you're doing it and they understand what's going on as well. Um, and then there's some guests that you'll bring on that have no notoriety at all, but they're interesting and you know that they have a message that's going to be helpful. That's a great person. Uh, things that you can do uh, when you're pitching and wanting to be a guest on a podcast is to actually personalize it. Our company, you know, we're a network of shows. We get 
hundreds and hundreds, maybe even more than that, pitches every single week. And most of them get ignored because they're just garbage. Um, it takes a few seconds to personalize something. You know, for example, it'd be like, hey, Oscar, I loved the episode that you have with Spencer and how you guys talked about, um, you know, the different vacations he had in Mexico and the story with the doorman really helped me out. I've had similar stories and I'd love to share that on your podcast if you think it'd be a fit with your audience. Boom, right there. That kind of thing will make you stand out. I love that. I love that. And in a world where we're all trying to uh, automate and, 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 you know, be, be, get things done without us and, or, and, 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 you know, make things almost robotic at times that, that element of personalization is, is key in what will win in the end. Right. Absolutely. And, and there is a balance between the two. I mean, you can go through, you can, you know, have the, the bulk of your message or, you know, the information about you copy and pasted, you can put in a link to Calendly to make it easy for the person to set up the meeting. You can attach a bio or you can just have a link so that they can get to know you really quickly. I mean, you can preemptively think like, okay, if they say yes, what are some of the questions they have? Or, you know, what would be the next steps? Make it really easy. And by making it easy for that person, they're going to say, this person's a pro. They're making my life something enjoyable. They're not taking my time. Yeah, this is something I want to do. And then from there, that catapults to relationship that leads to a lot of other things. Yeah. Awesome. What's the, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given, Spencer? Oh man. Whoa, you stumped me on that one. Um, <laughs> it's a big one. It's a big question. <laughs> I would say... Oh, um, that, that honestly, like has really stumped me. Um, it's okay. You can take about, your time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would honestly, I would take it back to, uh, probably simple stuff as a kid, like the golden rule is pretty important. Um, and then I would say treating people with love, you know, a simple principle that Jesus teaches. Yeah. Um, you know, all, there's no business thing that rises to my mind. None of that stuff honestly matters. Um, people that I know that are, you know, worth billions of dollars or incredibly successful, the ones that have done it right, when we get together, they never talk about business. Yeah. They just want to talk about their kids. They just want to talk about like the food they cooked on the barbecue. <laughs> they, they, I mean, that's really what it is. And like, and they talk about, you know, just loving others and um, embracing others. And, and that's the crazy thing because when you're in your teens or twenties, you're so hungry. You have so much energy, so much time. And you think that there are all these like major secrets and then you get older and you're like, nah, it really is just about loving others and treating others good. Yeah. Back to basics, man. I love it. Now you, you brushed over the golden rule. I don't know what that is. So maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit. Do unto others as you'd have do unto you. I believe that's yeah. the yeah. the phrase of it. I don't have it tattooed on my arm or anything, so <laughs> I can't read it verbatim. <laughs> yeah. You can't go back to the notes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. That's so, that's so powerful and, and so wise as well. And, and, and you're right at the end of the day, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter very much what we do with our business. Uh, yes, it leads to fulfillment and, and it's good to uh, put yourself against the test and to, and to expand your boundaries and to become more than, than what you are today. I, I, I love that element of, of growth but it needs to be balanced with, with, with the family stuff, because what's the point of being the best business person and having all the cash in the bank? If your family actually doesn't like you, um, that's, that's one of the things that I've, that I've taken away from life is there's a huge difference between love and like, and so you might love someone, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you like them. Mm -hmm. And so that litmus test for me is, is really powerful. Do, do I actually like this person? And I don't want to be someone that my kids love me just because I'm their dad. Like, of course you're going to love your dad because you know, he's your dad, 
but I want them to like me. And that's, that's so different. And so that's, uh, that's one of the things that I, that I think really resonate and why we resonate so much as well, Spencer, because you, you're a family guy. Um, you know, what's you're, you're switched on to the, to the game that's being played. And, and, and the game is that we're only here for a short time. So we've got to enjoy it while we're here. Is there anything that I'm going to ask you one of your own questions? Is there anything that I should have asked you that I did not ask you? Um, you know, we, we probably should have, we should talk about, um, the importance of others, of having the right people, uh, doing the, doing work with us. That, that is the thing that will make a difference. So I've, I've gone the route of solopreneur. I've gone the route of success and struggle and everything. And whenever I am too focused on myself or think too small or think it's something that I can do myself, uh, it usually fails. But if I think in ways that I can collaborate and maybe it's a new venture or something I'm not familiar with, but I, I sit there and I think, okay, who can I get to do this project with? And maybe I don't even know who I can get to do this with, but I know the attributes that I want and I can, uh, generate revenue early on or just take capital and infuse it into there and then quickly get other people on that's where it leads to success because uh it's no longer a single person game it's a multiplayer game and now you're responsible for those people and they realize the integrity that you have and they're in it as well and it's just pouring gasoline on the fire at that point yeah, absolutely. One of the one of the greatest fulfillments that I get is is hiring people and and giving them a great place to work. Because I myself have worked at places that have not been so great. So one of my one of my mantras is to create a great uh, working environment for people as well. And I love that you said the the fact that you you're now responsible for that person because it means you're you, you know you're a custodian and and you 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 oversee them and you take care of them almost like a shepherd, right? Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel very much like I love the team members that we have. Um, and I don't view any of them as less or, or more than each other. Uh, we all play our own roles and those roles are critically important. And it happens to be that, you know, my role is, is over and just doing a few specific things and their roles may be over there. And at the end of the day, I hope that everyone enjoys what they're doing. And I give everyone, uh, you know, freedom and autonomy to, to, to do that. And again, on, depending on your business, you know, I've owned brick and mortar businesses that, that have set hours and those set hours, you know, you, you, your freedom may be limited, but you can, within that boundary, you can give them as much as possible. Um, but you never do anything that's going to uh, take a person's freedom away, never do anything that's going to harm someone, never do anything that's going to try and elevate your status to look good. Uh, just treat people with respect and love and things tend to work out pretty good. I love that. All right. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Spencer. Um, any final words that you'd like to, uh, or any piece of wisdom you'd like to impart? Uh, yeah, I, I would say for anyone that's looking to grow a business, uh, it's, it's a lot easier than you think it is. Um, and it's a lot easier to play at a higher level. And it's a lot easier to do things um, on a bigger scale uh, or on your terms than it is to try and incrementally beat your competition. Um, I would just rid your vocabulary of competition and look for ways to do collaboration. There is, you know, depending on our market and, and we're in a, uh, at least speaking in terms of the US, but kind of globally, you know, we've just come out of COVID. Um, the economy in the US is uh, iffy at best and the economy in other countries, uh, same thing. That doesn't mean that there's a lot of opportunity. There is tons of opportunity because there are a lot of people that are scared right now and they need leaders, they need people to lead. And there are a lot of um, businesses where it's been predictable and everything was totally transformed. And so 
I think for us to grow a business, it's if we're playing, it's our duty to do our very best. Now, very best doesn't mean that you have to go in and, uh, you know, work 18 hour days. And it doesn't mean that you have to give your life to it. It means, you know, clearly know what you want and do the very best uh, with that. There are people out there. There's the, the Jeff Bezos of the world that want to build huge empires. It's not me. I just don't care for that. But I'm also the guy that I don't want to run a single man operation because I know I don't have that much of an impact. So you just have to find what you want. Absolutely. Finding that balance. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Spencer. Let me pause this recording. Stay with us for a moment, but thank you very much. Very, really appreciate your, your time, your, your energy and investing this wisdom uh, into myself and the audience. Thank you very much, Spencer. Thank you.